evening. My name is Dawn Numdu. I'm your host this evening for our session on Twitter Spaces called Gather to Grow. It's great to be back. My one speaker is here. So I'm just going to ask him to introduce himself, tell us a little bit about what he does, where he farms, where he's based. And tonight we're talking about growing brinjals, eggplant. I know this is a very niche crop and I actually had lots of trouble trying to find people and experts to actually talk to me about it. Yasis, thank you so much for being here. And tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're based, what you farm with besides brinjals to start off the conversation. And hi, everyone. So my name is Yasis Jayakodi, and our farm is Elysian Fields. We're based in Talton, which is just outside Krugerstorp in Gauteng. We've planted brinjals for two seasons, a few seasons ago. I've been farming for about six years now. Originally, the farm used to be an organic farm, and we started farming organically. And then recently, in the last three years or so, we've moved over to conventional. Thank you so much for being here. Now, brinjals, as I understand it, is a warm season crop grown for its fruit. When is the best time to plant this crop? And does South Africa's wide climate variation mean that new farmers can grow it all year round? It is a warm climate crop. So we planted it both times around towards the end of August, early September, when the season started changing. It does need the warm soil to grow properly. It obviously dies out in our area when the first frost hits. It's quite sensitive to frost. And we planted two and a half hectares each time when we planted. So the first season we planted was an organic patch and the type of brinjal was Black Beauty. And in the second season we did it again, but it was conventional. So both times the yields were pretty good and it's a beautiful fruit. We've got our own emoji. It was one of the first emojis, the brinjal on WhatsApp and stuff, wasn't it? So we did quite well in terms of crop yield. We got close to 22 tons per hectare and it carried on through until the first frost. And then we had to start preparing for the winter crop. I was laughing at the <laughs> points about the emojis. People usually just use it when they're chatting. <laughs> you can continue, please. So our speciality crop, I think maybe in the introduction I, I didn't mention, is green peppers and then beans in the summer seasons. And in the winter seasons, it's more broccolis. In terms of yield, we did quite well. But I think we're going to unpack the whole cycle as we go on. The marketing and sales of it, finding the right type of buyers for it, and actually the right specification of printables that the market wants. That's all lessons learned while you're doing the project, you know. Before we get into that, Yasis, maybe you can also just explain why it was so hard for me to kind of find people who grows it for more than just something on the side. What is it about this crop that makes it maybe not as attractive to new farmers or farmers in Mzanzi? It's because it's not a, a very high value crop. There's a lot more to offer with the high value crops that take a little bit longer time to grow, for example, and that propagate more fruit continuously. There isn't so much of a market. I think from our side, maybe if we were global gap accredited or we had any other type of accreditation, and if we were looking to export it, that might have been another avenue. But for the South African market, I think the mistake we made was the variety of fringal. We should have gone with a, a different type, which the market really wants. You mentioned now that you had to change over. Often farmers have to deal with frost and it's very de- it has a very devastating effect on production. What is the minimum temperature that the crop can withstand? And if you could explain what the ideal is from your experience. Also, just to mention that one of the farmers just let me know, Moketi, he's actually in Johannesburg as well. He says that he's actually currently harvesting and trying to chase his month in target. So he won't be making it. Apologies from his side and hopefully he joins another session. So yes, I'm going to have to pick on you. Hopefully Foley comes through, but I hope that you can kind of stand the ground for the session and maybe we'll get some engagement from our listeners as well. I don't think a lot of people eat brinjals. It's mostly, uh, if I could say, from what I've seen, my mother uses brinjals to cook and, and we're Indian. So she used it to cook brinjals in her curries and stuff, and she also pickles it, the smaller brinjals. The other uses for it is obviously when you slice it up and you do bakes and roasts and things like that, moussakas and things like that. So that's also an adaptation that when we started farming is to look at the plate. What are the consumers actually eating and how do they eat it and what do they want? So when we initially started farming, we just went gang-ho into what's the easiest, most resilient plants, what, what are the ones that, are, according to projections, give the best yields and things like that. But it all comes down to what the market wants. Specifically, do they want and how you can kind of serve that. There were a lot of learnings with, with the brinjals. Just a, a question around yes, the climate. What's the best climate? For us in our area, it's uh, September onwards, when the soil is more than five degrees upwards. We didn't really have too much issues with too much heat. The plants are quite resilient. Like I said, the first frosts, in one day, actually, when the first frosts came in May, the whole two and a half hectares was wiped out. The plants just dried up and died. So they're not that resilient to cold. So that's the climate issue with brinjals. 
We did one tunnel just to see how they perform in, inside the tunnels, but even that wasn't a heated tunnel or anything. They just died with, when the first frost came through. Well, Yasas, you're painting a very bleak picture for new farmers who might actually be interested in this crop. Let's start with some of the starting blocks. Um, yeah. First, soil type and also what the best fertilizer is to use for this crop. If you're planting right. in an open field or if you're trying tunnels, you know, what should you be yeah. thinking about? It's not a bad crop to plant. The point I'm trying to make really is that we need to have, as farmers, is you need to make sure that you have the buyer ready. And if you can, have contracts in place, and off-take contracts and stuff in place. The first season we did it, we were just following the old farmer's recipe and just planting on speculation, taking to market kind of thing. But it's not a, a very difficult plant to grow. We bought them in as seedlings and it's not as sensitive in terms of the time that you plant, put them in the ground. So like September onwards, it's just about giving it enough water. The soils that we have on our farm are quite clay and loamy, so it holds a lot of water. And the fertilizers that we used, we carried on the first season, we carried on the old farmer's organic fertilizer program. We used a lot of bio stuff, so it's biologicals that we used. And also every season we test our soils. We send samples, water and soil tests to a lab to get test results. And then we pass it on to our kind of fertilizer companies and they advise. And we talk amongst our farming kind of community as well. Like we, to interpret those test results is not that easy, but you kind of start getting a hang of it and you know what additives to put in and stuff. So the plants grow very well. Our soils were quite well taken care of and we still carried that soil program through. And the yield is just, it's fantastic. We don't have to do any kind of pruning. You just allow the plant to grow and it grows to quite good height at our farm at least. It, it grew to about 1.2 to 1.5 meters high. It was quite a beautiful thing to see to walk through that, that field. Okay, now you're making me a little bit more excited about it. Yes, as you spoke about seedlings, now is it better to grow your own seedlings or should new farmers be buying from suppliers instead? What was your advice and what did you do on your side? So when we bought the farm, we made sure that we had a mentorship program with the old farmer and we had a three-month mentorship program. The old farmer was growing his own seedlings. Him and his wife were doing their own seedlings in a kind of a little nursery. And we followed that program for the first season. But our aim when we bought the farm was we just saw the potential in scaling it up and kind of specializing in a few crops. So seedlings is very hard, guys. It's, it takes a lot of administration. You need to record a lot of things. You need to pay attention to weeding them. And it takes a lot of care, especially if you're growing seedlings through a transition season and trying to prepare them for the next season. We had to put them into a kind of cold room, became the heated room. We had some heaters in there to make sure the soil tipped high enough. And then during the day, we had to take out seedling trays, put them out in the sun. So after a year, we switched to buying seedlings from seedling suppliers. And the benefit of that is that you get kind of what you for plus another 5% in case of damages and stuff like that. So it takes away a lot of headache in terms of planning. You know, when you book the dates, it's coming on the 14th and the 28th, they're going to deliver the 75,000 seedlings. Whereas if you're doing your old seedlings, especially as a first time, you're never sure of the production rates and the success rates, etc. It's not to say that you shouldn't do seedlings. I think that could also become a niche for some farmers where they just focus completely on seedlings and become a seedling supplier, or they do it for themselves as farmers. But there's a steep learning curve in doing seedlings. But like anything, you can, if you put your time, effort and vision in, into doing it successfully, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can. These days, we always buy seedlings from a certain supplier and we're quite happy with what we receive. Thanks, Yasis, for that. And also just for establishing that there are many niche things that can be done within the sector. If you find your way around it and figure out what you're good at and what you can actually succeed at, focus on that. It is definitely possible. I couldn't agree more. What are some of the threats? Because as I understand it, cutworms cause quite a bit of trouble, especially with eggplant seedlings. What is the best way to protect them? And what are the other pests that you should kind of look out for? Did you have any trouble when growing this crop with specific pests that you had to deal with? Cutworm is a common one. We had red spider mites as well. Our programs are pretty good in terms of, especially because we were new at farming with the pest control. We, we followed the old farmers or the mentors program to the T. And we brought in quite a few people as well from different fertilized companies and pest control companies. But we, we really managed our risk quite well. So on the first season when we planted the first time, we had mulching plastics. So those are basically sheets of plastic rolls. I think they're about a thousand meters long. And we had drip irrigation under there. So what we were trying to achieve was to minimize weeds growing in between and also to retain the moisture in the soil. So that worked beautifully. That worked really, really well for us. And that's also a way of pest mitigation, right? So if you, if you don't have weeds growing in, in between, 
the pest still get attracted to the weeds and cause other stuff. And also with the roots, with the microbial pests, that also gets mitigated. It was a little bit expensive, but when I did the figures in terms of the weeding, the labor cost, we really won on that one. And we could use those mulching plastics. We used it for three seasons after that. It also protected the drip irrigation pipes from UV rays, and we got three seasons out of the drip irrigation as well. So basically, mulching plastics, maybe if you're not familiar with them, is quite a thick micron plastic sheet. It's white on the top to reflect the heat and light, and on the underside, it's black so to retain the heat and retain the moisture. It comes in rolls. You make your holes to put in your seedlings, whichever dist- distance apart they are. It's normally for brinjals. We did it at our 400 millimeter spacings. And we got the mulching plastics about a meter wide. We put in two drip lines between it, 500 millimeters apart. One more thing that we carried on with from the old farmer's organic methodology is he always would grow probably a half hectare of chilies and for sale. And about a half of that he would keep and dry in the sun. And once they dry, he blend them in a blender. And that powder, we boil it. After boiling it, I think for about 10 minutes, you strain that. And that's like a, a very good contact pest killer. So we used to put that on backpack sprays and, and spray the plants with that. And that really helped. Like I think some aphids came once and, and we really got rid of them very, very quickly. Overall, we didn't have major issues with pests at all because of the programs that we had and followed. Thanks, Yasas. I think I'm really in awe of your journey. I mean, six years is not a long time, but you have quite a bit of knowledge. And especially with this crop, just having grown it for two seasons. So hats off to you for that. Just a question in terms of timeline. How long do brindles grow when you're starting, you know, from seedling to the point of harvesting? So seedlings, we get them when they're, I think they're about a month old already. To get to almost a fully grown kind of plant, it takes another 60 to 90 days. It takes normally around that time. And it's dependent on various things, on the weather, on the amount of water it gets and things like that. But once it starts growing, it, it just shoots up to full size very quickly. And then the stems or the branches start growing out. And once you see the flowers, you know that the brindles are going to come soon. Once you see the flowers, like if you're walking through your field, you have to start planning to start picking very, very soon. So we actually got caught by surprise because I think the one week when we walked through the fields, there was nothing. And within a week, we were like overburdened. We didn't know what to do. We didn't have enough crates to pick. So it, it grows really fast once it starts flowering. And then I think they talk to each other, the plants, right? They tell each other to start pushing out the fruit. So it takes you by surprise if, if you're not paying attention. Thanks, yes, yes I love that. Can this crop take direct sunlight or does it need direct sunlight? I think in our previous sessions when we spoke about pepper farming, they mentioned that sunlight can actually damage peppers. Is this the case with brinjals as well? From what we saw, it loves sunlight. The leaves are quite nice and broad and thick and luscious. And from what the seedling guys explained to us, that's how Mother Nature created it, right? Is to protect the fruit beneath it. And we saw that. I mean, I think once we had a hailstorm in that area, we, had, we get hailstorms once in a while, once every couple of years. And we lost quite a bit of the fruit and we had to cut them out. So we had to actually pick all of them out, the ones that were damaged with marks and things like that, but just grow out again. The leaves are nice and thick and luscious and it protects the fruit. So it's quite, quite hardy that way in the sunlight. Now, you spoke about drop irrigation when you grew the specific crop. What is the best irrigation method when farming brindles? So the cheapest irrigation is, is rainfall. We don't have to do anything for crops like maize, I guess, where it's just rainfall that feeds the crops. The second one would be the 360 sprinklers. And then drip is slightly more expensive than that. At the time, it was being imported. And then now, recently, there's a guy who makes it. They've actually started production in near our area. We get good discounts because we're from the area and stuff. Drip is good. Normally, if it's exposed to sunlight, what the supplier also says is, is you can get probably two seasons out of it. What happens is usually is if you don't have a good filter system, because it's such a fine material that where the drip hole is, where the water exits right, the pipe, it can get clogged up with debris or even if the water is a hard water type of thing, it can get calcified and, and block the drip. And there's nothing you can really do about that. You have to pay attention to your filter system before it goes into your drip irrigation network. What we experimented was with, with that mulching plastic and we extended the life of the drip irrigation. But in terms of water saving, it's, it's, it's worth the cost. So drip goes down straight into, like as you've seen, into the soil around where the roots are. And you can, you can irrigate two times a day if you need to. If the plants are looking a bit sad, you can water them a lot more and you save quite a lot of water rather than the sprinklers. What happens also with the normal, they look like like 300 high sprinters with an orange spinner on top, right? What happens is once the plants start getting bigger, they kind of overtake the the sprinkler head 
the radius of that sprinkler it doesn't reach out as much it gets kind of deflected by the plants themselves so that's why i would prefer drip with this type of crop thanks justice i'm really picking on you this evening but you're giving us so much knowledge and i'm really happy that i was able to connect with you so claudia yeah. also just mentioned that she's having trouble with her network escom is really keeping our listeners away and our mm-hmm. speakers this evening but obviously you know that the session will be available on food from zanzi's youtube channel afterwards plus an article telling um, you more about it so if anyone missed anything don't worry you can still listen to the session afterwards so more around harvesting what happens in the harvesting process and just to explain a bit about how you went about it we have secateurs or scissors that we use to harvest and we cut it just above the stem there's like a little cap on the brindle and we leave probably a 50 mm stem portion on it and this is all advice from the market agents they tell us what the best way to pack them in the boxes as well so our methodology is, is we start very early in the morning start at 6 first light and we cut the fruit you you have to handle them quite carefully then they're quite soft and it's easy to make mark on the skin so you have to handle them that hardy in terms of handling so we place them into crates and then bring all the crates into the packing area we don't wash them there's no need to we wipe them down and then we place them into boxes directly so we were packing them into 4 kg i think they called pepper boxes and we had different sizes we had small medium and large and the best sellers were actually the small and medium ones but the large ones are all the ones that we actually we were late with picking so yeah p- picking all you need is really quite a few secateurs or, or scissors to pick some clean crates you have to make sure you the crate management process is also that there is a program where after every harvesting you wash them down and make sure that there aren't any rocks or hard particles in there so when you put the fruit down it doesn't get damaged these are all little things you learn as you do the job you know thanks for that yes now my previous question before this was actually around pruning but i think you mentioned earlier about this crop not necessarily needing pruning But yeah. what should you be aware of when the does start bearing fruit is there anything that you learned along the way our experience is not to prune and we didn't need to we were initially worried when the plant starts growing wide the branches would get too heavy with the fruit it really isn't a problem but with pruning it, it isn't really an issue so stuff like trellising you don't need it's quite a firm stem the main stem so you don't need to support it or, or trellis it or anything like that when the flowers do come out i mean we had quite a few bees that came and pollinated it the fruit flies that's also something that happens when the fruit starts appearing so one section is actually under shade net and we did a small patch there just to, to trial it and those ones i mean under shade net is ideal i think rather than tunnels just because it's a kind of aerate environment the tunnels it got too hot it got very hot but we opened the flaps out and stuff like that but yeah production was was still the same but i started getting a bit worried when it got very very hot we used to water them quite a bit inside the tunnels thanks yes sir What happens once you've harvested? What is the best way to store and also transport this crop? Does it need cold storage? What's the best and the ideal? Our methodology is to pick very early in the morning, the same day or early the next day we send to market. We didn't use a cold storage at all. We didn't invest in that. So it's one of our growth plans to eventually have that. But for this food, it lasts actually close to a week on the market floors. It's quite good. If you can harvest and get it to market as soon as you can, that's the best the ideal we used to pack in boxes like i said 4 kg boxes and then we'd get a truck and load the pallets on the smaller loads we'd load it on a, on a bucky and a trailer kind of thing and when handling the boxes just handle them with care kind of thing and then maybe i think i wanted to ask this question when you spoke about the harvesting already but just around mm. labor the support team agricultural workers the staff how extensive is it do they need to be hands on for that full harvesting process so the harvesting team is gets quite big I think we had 20 harvesters at, at a time. We stop picking around 11 o'clock. We don't pick all the way through. We like to pick early in the day and then start boxing it up. So we have a harvesting team. We have a team who wipes the fruit and places it into boxes. And we have another team that makes up the boxes from flat cardboard. So it can get quite labor intensive. For this size of farm, kind of the right amount of people that you would need, I, I don't think we can cut out any labor because we, we kept looking at ways of optimizing or reducing the cost per box, which is part of the farming game, I guess. We needed about 20 people for the four and a half hectares that we planted just for harvesting. And then we had a separate team wiping down and placing them in boxes and a separate team, two guys basically building the boxes to place the brindles in. Thanks, Jesus. Tabile, I see you in the space. I'm going to be picking on you soon to tell us also a bit about markets and what you experience as an, as an agricultural economist with the specific crop. Tabile is from the National Agricultural Council. So I hope that you'll also be able just to engage with, with us a little bit. more around the market i think we spoke in the beginning about what consumers want and it not really being 
a crop that people really go for and talk and really to choose to grow because people don't really eat it. What does it look like and why did you decide to go into it? Maybe I should also just ask you that question. So the first season, we, we were just following the, the old farmer's planting program that he had kind of written out for us. And it did well. We got decent prices in relation to the labor and the cost of production. We, we were successful and it wasn't, we didn't have too many issues or anything else. It was quite a hardy crop and it was a nice mix of, of stuff that we were sending to the market. We carried on the second season. So the reason we didn't carry on, we took a decision to focus on a high value crop that gives kind of more yield in terms of cash flow. And I would strongly suggest that if you're doing any type of crop, whether it's brinjals, green peppers or whatever it is, you need to make sure that the, you're, you're growing what the market wants. It all comes down to, I should have listened to my mother when she said these brindles are too big. The black beauty variety, we should have just gone with the smaller ones. But those are all learnings, I guess. In farming, there's lots of learnings. Such a beautiful crop. When we used to pack the boxes and load the trucks, such a beautiful sight. Shiny looking fruit, and they look so good. Thanks, Yasas. I think you're making me want to actually go out and buy some and make it as well. For me, I have a much better understanding of this crop, how it's grown, what the market looks like. What else do you think we should be focused on? I think we focused on a lot of areas. And then also just in terms of other processing, besides selling the crop itself, is it can you can one sort of chop it up and package and sell it in that way? Are there other options for yeah, farmers? I think definitely there is. We just weren't ready at that time to look at those pre packs. If you go to the shops and you look at the vegetable section, there is always in those baked packs, there's always brindles that are chopped up into almost like quarters, like chunky pieces that you put into the oven tray. I think that's something that we didn't explore. That's something that could be done or can be explored into more detail. If you're doing the, those kind of packing, I've never seen brindles on its own. I've always seen it as a mix. So maybe it would be a good idea to either grow, mix, or buy from other farmers and make your own mixes and then and sell. Thanks so much, Yasas. Um, given us so much to think about with this crop. Just in terms of motivating farmers listening, anyone in the space to explore it. My uncle grew it in his garden and he was very proud of it. I think he described it almost in the same way that you just did <laughs> about it looking so beautiful and, you know, being yeah. so proud of it. But what, what would you leave with us sort of in closing as we wrap up about so, this specific crop? If I had to do it again in a season or two, I might look at it again because we know how to grow it and we did it well with it. What I would do is I'd, I'd mix it up. I'd do a smaller portion as beauty which is the large fruit forming variety. And I'd do probably 70% of it, a smaller and longer type of brinjal. I'd mix it up like that. And I'd look at finding the buyer, finding the niche markets. It's mostly, from what I know, it's mostly the Indian markets that would buy it up. But then also there's the pre pack market that I look at. Not a difficult crop to grow, quite a resilient crop in the summer season. Do your research first and then go into it if it works for you. Thanks so much, Yasas. Just as we wrap up for those who may have most your introductions, more about your business and the crops that you grow and then i'll ask you just to share one final message and then i think we're wrapping up june so maybe just the youth month message would be really cool <laughs> my, my name again is yathas jayakwadi my background is actually construction management i'm a project manager and i got kind of pulled into farming when i was in a business incubation hub and i need to mention the two people who pulled me into farming it's eric mawane he's also actually around the corner from our farm in Talton. The farm's name is Elysian Fields and Mbali in Walker. We were, all three of us were, happened to be in, a, in an incubation hub. I was there for my project management business. Mbali was there for her HR business. But Eric was there as a farmer. And our session was there, started at 11. And Eric walks in and he says, he's done for the day now. He doesn't have anything else. He's just here for this course. And we're like, okay, so what do you do? And he said, he's a farmer. And I think six months later, I saw on Facebook or somewhere, a picture of Mbali holding her first crop of peppers. She just fell into it completely. She went and visited Eric. And we also went, I think a year later, we started getting into farming. What I saw from the farmers around as well is that it's such a sharing community in terms of knowledge, in terms of expertise. It's not what I expected, especially like just outside Kruger's door. I had my own stereotypical kind of mindset of what farmers are. They're really caring people who want everyone to succeed. And there's enough space to succeed for everyone, you know? You're mentioning two of the farmers that I met in my journey when I started in agricultural media. Mbali yeah. Noko is actually the first farmer that I interviewed awesome. and, and yeah. spoke to. And both of them are absolutely amazing people. They and are. I can they see are. more of that the agricultural industry, you know, once you're in it, you realize how much you love it. And it's kind of hard to walk away. So, yeah, I definitely agree with you there. Let me just give Tabele a chance to speak and then you can share your final message of hope. Tabele, the floor is yours. Thanks for the opportunity as well, and also greeting to the other farmers and the colleagues at large that are within the space. So personally, this is not a plant that I normally go for in terms of type of work that I will do. 
just because I mean it's not a plant that is very a large in terms of its production and also within the space that I normally go around, it's not something that I tend to come across with. There was a question that John asked in terms of the labor. What is the ratio of labor to health for this plant? Because I think it sounds like it's a bit intensive in terms of the number as well as, if I may ask as well, in terms of the fertilizer consumption, how much does it, it requires for it to produce right yields and the quantities in terms of one buying fertilizer because it's currently an issue now in South Africa and globally? And also, if I have a hatter, for example, how much how much quantity one would get from, from a hatter of the plant? And the last is mentioned something about the marketing agencies that you work with. Do you mean like you only sell the plant via the agencies or you have other means like having links to the larger retailers or the fresh produce market that you have across the country? Those are very technical questions, very agricultural economist type of questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> in terms of fertilizer consumption, can't tell you off the bat. We, we record all of that stuff. We couldn't really put a scientific approach to it. It was our first year, the first season, second, second season. We did what felt right and what we felt like we needed. The amount of labor we used for the four and a half hectares that we planted was 20. We had 20 people harvesting and then we had another team of people wiping down the food of about four and two people building the boxes and then everyone else would come and then we'd load the truck. So around 20 to 25 people, I'd say, for four hectares. So if it's a hectare, I guess you divide that by that, that amount. And that's just during harvesting season. When you're planting, obviously, you can have quite a big number of labor to just plant it. And then you have to take care of weeding, which learned in the first season, weeding took up a lot of time and effort and labor. And then the second season, we did the mulching plastics to try and eliminate that. So that was the labor question. This, the third one was the production of the yield per hectare. We got around 22 tons per season, and I think that's kind of in the range. We didn't have too much of waste. Well, the first year we had quite a lot of waste because it just surprised us. We weren't prepared for that. It grows almost as fast as baby marrow, I can say. You have to pay attention and you have to, once it starts flowering, you have to start having a picking program and sending to the market kind of program. So I think it's related to the last one, which was market agencies. We worked through two or three different agents at the Joburg market. That's where we used to send to. In the first year when we were organic still, we used to send to another farm who had a contract with the big retailers. So they were global gap accredited. They had a facility that was accredited. At that stage, we were accredited with an organic certificate from Germany called Kiwa BCS. We used to sell as organic in the first year. In the second year, we changed over to conventional. And it was purely because of cost of seedlings. That covers uh, a lot of what I've asked and a little bit more. Uh, so just a bit of an um, additional comment. Um, so you, then it, it means then that you, you do not have like a, a direct sort of a link if you were to sell to a, a global market because such a crop, they tend to be you know, used by a lot of advanced in terms of uh, the populations and the economies. So mm-hmm. you do not necessarily have that kind of a link. So you go through your agencies if one is to go that route. That's right. It was our first years of farming. Now, if, if I wasn't focused on a specific crop, the way I would do it is I'd start with uh, export agencies, export market agents, and I'd look at cold storage. I'd look at what kind of specific varieties they want, and that's how I would do it. I think it is viable if, if you are focusing on an export market. It can be done. You just need to do the work. Thanks, much. Appreciate that. Thank you. No problem. Thanks so much, Yasus. I don't have any questions, other questions from my side, and I don't see that anyone else has grabbed the mic. But I'd like to thank you again for sharing your knowledge on this specific crop. And I'll definitely be calling on you in terms of your other productions and, you know, other crops that you produce, because I think you're really passionate about this. And I'm so happy Mm. to have connected with you. Just maybe one final message from your side, and then we'll wrap up. Thanks. I hope all the listeners enjoyed it. I mean, I'm not the expert. It's just my experience is what I'm sharing with you. We're a husband and wife team. My wife and I run the farm. And initially, she was running it first. And she just couldn't be here today. So when we go to the farm, we do two different things. I always try to climb on top of the pump house and try and get an aerial view of the whole farm and make grand plans of how we're going to do hectares and hectares of crop and how we're going to buy the next farm next door and the one behind us and all of that. And my wife, she grabs a, a hoe and she goes and joins the workers weeding. She loves doing that. It's because of the different types of jobs we do as well. Now. That's her kind of meditative relaxation thing. And she likes getting her hands in the soil. I like doing the high-level stuff and driving the tractor and the, the fun stuff. But the closing message is that as a farmer or with any type of crop, you have to be fully involved. It's not an easy job. If you don't have the passion, you're going to get beaten down. You lose a lot of things, a lot of revenue with stuff that's out of your control, like hail, rains. 
the only tractor that you have breaks down and you can't repair the fields, for example. So it's a special type of person who goes into farming and stays there, but we are a supportive group. It's tough. So I can encourage all the area you want to get into it and do your best at it, and you can be successful at it. And thanks for the opportunity, Don. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much um, for being with us, Yastas, and we'll be contacting you also just to feature you on Food from Zanzi. I think you have an absolutely amazing story, and I would Thank love you. to share it with our audience. Thank you so much to everyone engaged. Thanks, Tabile. Don? Yes. If you have to look into the country as a whole, where exactly, like, where is it concentrated in terms of the production, the crop itself? Which areas across this country where it is seem to be like doing well? I think that has to do with the temperatures and weather in general. Does well is in the KZN area because that's where the large Indian market is as well. So I didn't do the research, I don't know. Probably it has to do with the issues because even paper, they tend to do very well that side, I mean, more than they do other areas. No, thanks for that. No problem. No problem. Okay. Thank you so much once again and have a lovely evening. Happy farming.